Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie and I'm an alcoholic. When I tell you that I'm an alcoholic, it's a real responsibility that I've also agreed to. Because I'm not here for any other reason than to share my story with you and to be of service to Alcoholics Anonymous in any way that I can. To hopefully that someone here who is struggling tonight and it might be someone brand new, or I've sat in these seats many years sober and struggled, that they will find some hope and some comfort in these rooms by something that happened tonight, and that they will come back to another meeting. It's my responsibility as an alcoholic to carry the message that I've been given as a result of taking these steps and living this program as a way of life that I take very seriously. And I want to thank Bob for inviting me to come and participate tonight. I want to thank Susan, uh, who's hosting me. And um, it's just such a, what a treat. I came in and I saw John and I saw Judy. And I've met some other people from the Bay Area. And what an exciting thing this is for me. So thank you for having me. And I also want to welcome the people that said they were new. You might be here for your first time or your manyth time, but I hope it's your last time. I hope that you stay and you do what we do, because if you want sobriety, we will show you what we have done. And we're here to be of help and to service to you. And there's three things I always like to tell you about me first, because these are the three things that once they were all in place, I I stayed sober, amazingly so. But before that, I didn't. And so I know the formula, the very simple formula for me that worked and continues to work. That is, a we have the triangle of recovery, unity, and service. And I work very hard to apply all of those in my life. And then we, I also have a personal triangle for me that was so key and still is. And that's a sobriety data home group and a sponsor. It seems that like it's like a little umbrella and everything just sort of falls underneath that, the taking of the steps and working with others and having studying our literature, our wonderful literature that has just tremendously given me guidelines to live by, um, being in service and all the other things that we learn to do here. Those three things have been a key, the key formula for me. And so my sobriety date, is February the 8th, 1976, which means I've been sober a little over 31 years. And it also means I got sober when I was four, okay? So get those numbers out of the way for you there. Um, And it's not my first sobriety date, but it is my current one. And it will stay my current sobriety date as long as I continue to do the daily maintenance. Now, what is that? For me, just a few of those things are, I have, I start and close my day in the same way, and that the, that's the bookends of prayer. I started my day this morning as I have done for many, many years, for decades, and that is I, I, when I wake up, I choose to address the God I've developed a relationship with on my knees, and I ask that God, please help me stay sober today. And I did that this morning. And the reason, in addition to the obvious that I do it, is it's my insurance. First of all, I'm real, real aware that all I get is a daily reprieve, contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. So I ask that power greater than me for that strength and to help me stay sober. And every new person I have ever known was here left and came back with a new sobriety date. I've asked them the same question. And I've gotten the same answer. I haven't gotten a different answer in 31 years. And I asked them, the day you took that drink, or maybe you started with the pills, did you ask God to help you stay sober that day? No one has given me a different answer other than no. 
And so for me, it is vital that I ask for that help today and that that is part of the regime or the, for me. I ask God to show me how you want me to be of service today. Please relieve me of any obsessions I may have because I don't know about you, but I have never had a good obsession. Um, it's, I've never been obsessed with eating more vegetables or something like that. You know, it's some resentment or a hurt or, you know, something like that, but it's never a good one. And those negative obsessions always distract me in a bad way. And so I ask for that. And I like to say the third step prayer, the seventh step prayer. I have some things that I like to read. And, and, and I take 15 minutes of a morning, and it's just for me before the phone starts ringing. I take that 15 minutes, and it's mine to make that connection with God. And that's, that's good. I love that. It's an important time for me. And I go on about my day, and I do things like I answer my phone without screening my calls. And that could be a spiritual awakening, you know. Um, because I've learned that most of my opportunities for service come through the telephone. And so I answer my phone. I'm active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I um, am in service wherever I can see that opportunity and wherever I'm asked. I don't take that first drink or anything else that affects me from the neck up either. And that was one of the vital key things that I, I, I learned here. And I don't know, I was thinking about this the other day, I remember. And I think many of us have ex had this experience when we first learned if you, if I don't take the first drink, I won't get drunk. Remembering how profound that information was. And of course, I didn't believe it because it was obviously the fourth or the fifth or whatever, but it was never the first one. But how amazing that information was. And so I don't take the first thing that affects me from the neck up. And I'm very, very protective of my sobriety. I'm the only one who can be the most proactive in my sobriety. If I treat it with disrespect, why would anyone else? If I don't give it any priority, why would anyone else in my family? I have to protect it because I will definitely have the most benefit than anyone sitting in this room will by me being sober. And so for me, that sobriety date is very black and white. And for me, that means I don't drink near beer, okay? I don't smoke near pot, okay? Because you know what? I have never been near drunk either. I've never been a happy hour kind of girl, you know, where you just have a few and go home. I mean, I've just, I'm either drunk or undrunk. Those are the two states of mind. And so I know that by playing with this near sort of pseudo kind of stuff, that I'm looking for the effect. I took the second drink because I like the effect produced by the first one. I'm looking for the effect if I'm taking in something to make me different. And they're not going to do it, so I will find something that will, and I know that about me. So I'm very proactive in protecting my physical sobriety. But I also know that physical sobriety is the foundation. And I came in here thinking that all I have to do is not drink or take any drugs and life is just going to get wonderful automatically. And it didn't because I don't know how to change anything on the inside. I can make that outside look real good. But it was the inside that was empty and unkept. And I didn't know the change that would come about by taking the steps. And so I thought that if you just didn't drink, it'd get wonderful. And I, of course, I would drink again. And so... Physical sobriety for me has simply been the launching pad into the rest of this program. But it is where it begins, and it must be in place for me on a 24-7 basis. And then I end that day in prayer and review of that day. And no matter what kind of a day it's been, I thank God for another sober day. That's how I start with my physical sobriety and the sobriety date. My Second, third thing are equally important to me, and that is a home group. Um, if I wasn't here tonight, I would be in my home group. It's called the Primary Purpose Group. It's in Dublin, California. It meets Thursday nights, 8 o'clock. Nancy has been there, Nancy J. And um, y'all are welcome if you're ever in my area of the country. And um, 
I realized when I made this last move that I have lived in four very different areas of the country, and I'm really grateful for that experience. Because if you've ever moved, I guarantee you I know what your very first thought was, and that was, they ain't doing it right here, you know? And even goofy, when I made my first move, I knew they really don't care wherever I came from how they do it back there. So I knew I needed to adapt myself to the personality of that area and learn how they did things instead of judging it. And so I've lived in four very different areas of the country. That is the only reason to this moment I've had a different home group. I've literally moved out of that state or that part of the state. And so that's the only reason I have uh, done that. And I also realized on this last move, I've also had four different last names. Okay, so it just kind of worked out that way, you know. Uh, so it's always interesting what last name you knew me by first, you know, is where we met. So, But anyway, a home group is so vital to me. I can go to a thousand meetings a week, but I have one home group. And that home group gets more of everything of me. My time, my money, my energy, my commitment. And I am present. I am there. I am an activist in that home group. And I have learned how to live with you and especially out there because of a home group. The very first things I remember learning when I got sober was courtesy and consideration. I knew absolutely nothing about that, about how to pay attention and, and how to sit still and how to not talk and how to be present in the meeting, how to be thoughtful of the people around me. There have been so many one-liners that I'm so glad I was in my seat and the person next to me was too, that if I would have missed, the direction would have been much different. So many things that I have heard because I was present in the meeting I was in at that time. I learned how to have a commitment, and I was terrified of responsibility because you, you all just don't understand. I am not trustworthy. I am not reliable. I've go, got this all going on in my head, but you just said we do it a meeting at a time, and that began to, okay. I mean, it wasn't like I had a big, important jobs. They put me on group jobs, you know, just in the beginning. But I've always had commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous, more than one. And so I, I've learned how to be of service and anonymously. I didn't need to have the big deal job and I didn't need to be up front or get the recognition. My ego wanted that, but you taught me how to just be anonymously in service to the meeting. You've taught me how to place principles before personalities. I, uh, I know what it's like to sit in that home group meeting and it's you and the soon-to-be ex he and the brand new she, okay? I know what that's like and I know that, uh, it tell you, it makes me work the back of the room where the newcomers are very hard, you know? Not that I don't, it just makes me put that focus where it's supposed to be and that is as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and for no other purpose am I here. I know what it's like to just learn how to sit in the rooms when you're extremely uncomfortable. I know how to be a better daughter because of you. I know how to be a better employee because of you. I know how to be a friend and not keep score. I was a big scorekeeper. For some reason, that was important. And, it, and you told me, get rid of that. And when I finally did in my mind, the scoreboard in my mind, what a freedom that was. And I don't know about your home group, but there's when we talk about principles before personalities, there's always been a couple of people in my home group that I know would be happier in someone else's home group, okay? I don't know if you have that here or not, but it was amazing when I thought about it. I was the one who had these different home groups. You know, I was the common denominator here. It wasn't those people. And I realized that if I'm thinking that, if I don't say it to anybody, but if I'm thinking that about someone, I'm bound to have people thinking and wishing I'd go to somebody else's home group too, you know. So I just know that I have learned here how to get along with the world around me because I'm an isolator. I'm 
completely comfortable by myself. I can easily entertain myself and amuse myself and so forth. I don't really need anybody, and that is a dangerous thing for me. That is why it is so important that I am an activist here, because I know how easy that would be for me to fall into very gradually and very quickly. So home group, very vital. And the third thing is a sponsor. At 31 years sober, I wouldn't dream of being without a sponsor. I've had three in sobriety, one in Atlanta, one in Minneapolis, one in my current one is Millie G. from Southern California. We've been together on this path for over 20 years, and that relationship means a lot to me. And I'm active with her, and I call her, and, and I would say my first 10 years, even though I had sponsors and I would utilize them, for some reason there is, I've just been more active in sponsorship both ways with one and in sponsorship in the last 20 plus years and so that has been a beautiful gift to me uh, sponsorship will will definitely keep my ego in place and keep me right sized working with others will keep me present and staying ahead of them and making sure that what I'm passing on is something that I currently do and am and so it's a wonderful way to keep myself right smack dab in the middle of this. So if you are new here or sitting in this room feeling restless, irritable, and discontent, I just would like, and you don't have one or all three of these things in your life in an active state, a sobriety date that's honest, a home group you're active in and a sponsor you actively are working with, I invite you to put those into your life. Because if you don't like the way you're living anymore, that has been the solution for me, and it's worked for over 30 years, 31 years. And I invite you to incorporate that in your life and join us on this journey. And my journey to Alcoholics Anonymous began in April of 1970. I was 12 years old, and I had been invited by the cool kids in school to this upcoming party on Friday nights. Now, I had heard them talk about drinking. I've never seen anyone drunk. I'm going to be the first person I see drunk. I have never seen any adverse effects about drinking. I would have absolutely no clue what the intake of alcohol was going to do for me and to me. I had no clue. I had The people that I saw around me were people, we, I learned the term here in AA, were called social drinkers. And for some reason, though, I never thought about the way they drank until I got sober and started looking back over my life. It never, I never thought about that. But this was on a Monday when I got invited, and I wanted to be a part of those kids. They were the ones I wanted to be with, because there was the smart kids and there were the athletic kids, and I was neither of those. But these kids were smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, skipping school, and they were having some fun out there. And I wanted to have some fun. Friday rolls around, and I woke up that Friday morning, and I made, I had some regular things on my mental list, and I woke up, and they were to be a good daughter and a good student and obey the rules and stay out of trouble. I am somebody who's a conformist. I'm not a rebel. If you say turn right, I'll turn right. I don't question that. I want to do the right thing. I want to do well. I don't like negative, negative attention. I want to do well. And then the second thing on my mind was that I'm going to get drunk tonight. Now, I don't know how you get drunk. Somehow I, I had it in my mind you'd have to drink a whole bunch. I don't know, but that's what I'm going to do because this seems like the only time I'm going to be have this opportunity. It's like my debut, you know, and I can't mess it up. And so we arrive at that party that night. And they were 12 and 13 years old. It's kind of like a liquid potluck, you know, whatever somebody stole and brought from the store and your parents and stuff. And so God knows what it is we're drinking, but who cared, right? It was booze, and that's all I cared about. And it was going, something was going around in like a brown bag, and I, I didn't know what was in it, but I knew it was alcohol. And I just couldn't wait till it got to me. And so when it finally did, I had kind of watched what they were doing, so I wouldn't look stupid, you know, how you are, and like you old hat to you. And I took a pull off of that bottle, and I gave it to the next guy. That's what I saw them do. And that first drink, I don't I'll tell you, just ripped out my throat. But you know, it's kind of like you can always get another throat. You know, don't stop there. 
You know, just see what's going to happen. And what was going to happen was a few moments later, it goes down and just quietly like hot lava, it just fills in every hole in my gut and it's warm and it's thick and it just fills them in. And I didn't even know I had any holes in my gut, but my shoulders relax. And, you know, I didn't have, I didn't take that first drink because I felt like I'd been dropped off from another planet, came from a horrible home situation, violence, abuse, quite the contrary. Nice, kind, loving, middle class parent, only child, worked very hard, Catholic upbringing, Catholic school, church, nice, kind people, never seen the car driven up on the yard or anybody wearing lampshades or nothing, you know. These are nice, there was absolutely no reason in the world for me to take that drink other than the fact that I'm 12 years old, experimenting life, and I want to be a part of these kids, and that's what they're doing. But we would never have guessed that when I take a drink of alcohol, something like that happens inside of me that they have never in their life experienced. I have no idea the last drink my mother ever had. It's been decades, okay? My father's one of those people that has a couple. And that isn't an every night thing. That's when they would have company. But when I took that drink, this this relaxation happened over me. And I'm 12 years old, and there's this warm glow two inches behind my belly button, and I'm thinking, you know what? Oatmeal has never done this for me, you know? And I don't know what's in there, but I want some more. And it came back around, and I took, as I said earlier, I took the second drink because I liked the effect produced by the first. And I wanted some more of that. And I took that second drink, and I gave gave it to the next guy, ripped out my throat again. And it did something that, that would change the course of my life. Maybe it was the first drink that changed the course, but if we cross over a line from social drinking to alcoholic thinking, and drinking. I had just done skipped over that line, and I did not know that I've just had the one and only drink for social purposes I would ever have. That second drink went from here being anxious and hoping you'll accept me to down here full of arrogance. I went from please accept me to looking around that room of kids that night and thinking to myself, hey, aren't they glad I'm here, you know? When I heard three months sober, Clancy say of that almost instant change of perception happens to people like us, I was dumbfounded and felt like I just, that's it. That's exactly what happened that second drink. And I, I, it was perfectly put into words for me to describe that. That second drink, I no longer needed you or your approval. It was the last night that I would share a bottle of alcohol. Um, I don't know if I was born an alcoholic. I really don't. I had some standard only child, selfish, self-centered, self-serving behavior that was just built in. But when I took that drink, I activated the disease of alcoholism, and I would do for the next several years things I never thought about doing, never read about doing, never heard about doing. I would follow a path that was as if I was on a magnetic pole that I would never think twice about, look back about, or question. I activated the disease of alcoholism, and nobody knew what this was. I told you how I woke up Friday morning, good ideals, get drunk. On Saturday morning, they were in reverse. I woke up thinking about drinking, and I had activated that night, that first drink, the mental obsession. I couldn't wait to do it again, and those good ideals are eventually off the list because you can't drink the way I like to drink and do those, and so they go. I activated the physical craving. I did not know that when I take a drink, I take a drunk. I always wanted to get drunk, and so it wasn't. it was a choice as I saw it. I didn't know that I had lost the power to choose that very night. And every time I would get in trouble, it wasn't, gee, I better slow down. It was, gee, I'm sorry I got in trouble. I'm just going to have to learn how to lie better. 
I activated the physical craving. And again, these are things my parents have never, ever experienced. When I drank that night, I would set some very common things that would happen to me. I would drink as much as I could, as fast as I could, whatever I could and whenever I could. It was just not anything in any kind of, of uh, constriction whatsoever. A year later, I'm uh, the way that I drank I, as, at every opportunity pro po possible and created. A year later, I'm 13, and I'm introduced to the wonderful world of drugs, which I needed to be. I needed some accessories to help me stay conscious longer before that inevitable blackout. Because I black out, I drink whiskey out of a bottle with a beer chaser. I've never been someone who likes drinks with ice or umbrellas or fruit or, you know, you just, I want to get there right now, not tomorrow. And I find that whiskey just happens to be what I like. But I black out and I think, find things like, yeah, I've never wanted to sleep through life. I want to be in the middle of it all. And I find things like speed and acid will help you. And um, they will. Um, they'll help you get there quicker and in color. And I'm with you. I'm with you on that. And so that becomes my regular kind of thing in the last year and a half of my active drinking I'm 16 and 17 years old, and my diet is whiskey and acid, and I don't think anything odd about this whatsoever. The progression has been so fast, and it's just been almost transparently accelerated, and I don't think anything of it. I'm 17 and a half years old. I have absolutely um, been that tornado through the lives of so many people already, the trouble that I've gotten in. When my name is in the newspaper, it's not because I'm on the honor roll anymore. Um, when my dad's picking me up, it's not at a friend's, it's now at jail. Um, I have embarrassed this family. I have, um, you know, in little small towns, everybody knows what's going on. We lived in these little towns, and, and you know, I just, uh, I, I, but I don't have a problem, so I'm not seeking any kind of solution for a non-existing problem. But my father had tried all human power to relieve me of my alcoholism, and when he could not do that, he sought the own professional advice. He did not know what else to do. And so they said, while well, you still have legal custody, you need to commit her. And on a Friday, May of, May of 1975, I came home looking for money, I'd been on a two-week vacation that I, I was the only one who knew I was on vacation. Um, and um, I'd already been expelled from my senior year of high school, so it didn't matter um, to me. And uh, I came looking for money, and uh, they had other ideas. And I was sent to this treatment center for alcoholism and drug addiction. I would be introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous for the very first time. I mean, again, I want, I'm not looking for a solution to a non-existent problem here. And we would be taken to outside meetings, and because I'm not an alcoholic and I just I don't want to look like I'm joining or something, I sat in the back, as a friend of mine says, behind the paint. And uh, I totally related with that phrase. And uh, just would distract myself so these people that are doing exactly what I'm doing tonight would get done. And uh, every now and then I would tune into what they were saying because naturally I was encouraged to find the similarities, but I have to find the differences. Because if I find the similarities, then I might be one of those people, and I don't want to be one of those people because I'm not done drinking, and I know that, but nobody's listening to me, so I'm just going to do this thing so I can get below the radar. Nobody's going to be watching, and I can just sort of invisibly go back to my old life, which is drink every day. That's really all I want to do. It's just real simple. Why can't anybody understand that? And so I would hear them say things that I would rationalize in my mind. I heard them say things like, um, I lost my family because of drinking. That is serious. And my, but my mind said, you can have mine, okay? Um, I don't want them. Uh, they're always talking about my drinking, and so you can have them if you need them. But I, in my own small way, was saying that, you know, yeah, I had been asked to leave their home because they no longer had a safe place to come home to because of my drinking. 
I heard you talk about totaling out cars. And my mind said, I have never totaled out a car officially. Okay? Now, I lived in small towns, as I told you, and I arrived here with a little drunk car, the kind, you know, when you buy them, they're square. They start off square. And then when you drink and drive, because that is the only way I know how to drive, is uh, things are rounded out with the drunk bumps and falling off and, you know, missing and... and um, the uh, window had been shot out of it, and uh, my gas cap was a mitten I had stuck in there, okay? So I'm driving a Molotov cocktail around, basically, you know, just, Jesus. And, um, but, you know, I found the differences there, and they talked about uh, losing jobs, and I always had a legitimate little job to go to. I was not successful any other way. Um, and so I had real little jobs to go to, but I did go through them at a pretty good clip because, well, I had learned, I guess, how to quit a couple of them before I got fired. Um, I was let go from a couple, but that last year especially, I had gotten a kind of a bad habit and I would quit in blackouts. That's fine until you go to work the next day, you know. You don't know you've quit, you know. It's just so awkward, you know, to do these things. And um, and so these are the things that I would really work on rationalizing why I'm, see, I'm not like you, but in my own small way I was. And then there were two things I heard, and one was that all those broken promises, and I, I thought, how do they know about those? I mean, that was like this, Revelation, and if, like you uncovered some big secret, and the thing of it was, it was like a like a duh. I mean, who can keep a promise and drink? Because usually the promises involve not drinking. In my case, and I can't do both, and so I will go as long as I can, which is almost two weeks. When the second Friday rolls around, all bets are off. It's just the way it was for me. Those Fridays always trip me up, you know. Um, there was also another uh, time that I really heard the message loud and clear, and there was a woman who talked about trying to scrub away the smell. And I thought, now, I've had this funny odor for about a year, and I don't know what it is, and I've tried to puff and powder and perfume it away, and it doesn't go away. And she's talking about that that was booze coming through her pores, that she's an alcoholic and she doesn't drink anymore. I know that she knows what the smell smells like. And if I'm not careful, I might be one of those people. And so I um, got that, was as close as I got to alcoholics, and I was thinking I might be one of you, but I'm not done. I was sent to an all-women's halfway house. I did the bare minimum there. This is my first memory of doing the bare minimum, thinking it was going to give me the maximum, and it doesn't. The bare minimum was don't drink, don't take any drugs, and go to one AA meeting a month. Okay, I'll go to one a month. I'm not going to go to two, you know, and look like I'm getting involved or something. But I'll go to that one a month, and I did that for seven months, and I didn't drink, and that's all. I, you know, didn't do any steps. I took five to one through five to get out of that treatment center, and to the best of my newcomer ability, Came to California, visited my mother for two and a half weeks. First week, I'm hanging around the people I used to drink with. Last week, and half drunk and loaded with them. No surprise. And yet, this drinking week and a half was so different from what I had ever experienced prior to, to my introduction to AA. And it really, uh, I was mad because I had heard you talk about it'll ruin your drink and that there's nothing worse than a head full of A and a belly full of booze, and I have just proven for myself that that is a true statement. And uh, I was mad that it didn't work, and I blamed California booze and drugs. That's what I did. And I went back to Minneapolis, and I felt, boy, you know what, I've, I've really learned my lesson, and I stepped my meetings up from one a month to one a week. That sounded like an awful lot of meetings to me when you're still not committed to doing much of anything here, trying to get the maximum, doing the minimum. And five weeks later on a Friday, I got a letter in the mail that had one joint in it. 
And like anybody who's still uncommitted to recovery, I decided to keep it because I thought, you know, you just never know when you might need something like this. You never know. And uh, it was amazing I needed it the next day, you know. <laughs> Timing is everything, right? Yeah. And that was on the 7th of February. I smoked that one joint and I had so much conflict within. The battle was just so loud. And it was almost like that. Not physically did I feel this way, but emotionally, I, you just, how you go straight up and then when the crash, it is just straight down into the dirt. And after I smoked that one joint, for some reason, that would be the last thing to this moment that I would ever take, do, apply in a mood-altering sense. I had no idea, no plan. That wasn't the deal, but that's how it would be. And I came within crashing down, and I just emotionally, mentally, and, and spiritually just flatlined for me within. Physically, I can still get the look good going on. But I had been dead for such a long time that this was the last thing in order for that internal to die to start to live. And instead of all of, I, I did not want to keep breathing if this is the way it's going to be. And instead of finding all the excuses and all the reasons why my case is different and all the objections, what happened is I didn't even say a prayer but that moment and that window opened up and the idea came into my mind and it wasn't created by me, but I believe it was from a God that said those people in AA seem to know what to do. And the next day I went back to that meeting, uh, once a week meeting I'd been going to, and I went up to the old timers and I asked the most important question of my life. I said, what do you do to stay sober? And that was the end of the question. And my body language told them, there will be no debate. I'm not going to sit here and, and debate anything with you or argue or yeah, but you or my case is different you. My life just stinks and I'm running it. I've confirmed that from what you tell me. I don't want to live this way anymore and I have bottomed out for myself and what do you do? They tell me, well, what we do is one day at a time. We don't take the first drink or anything else that affects us from the neck up and we have a sobriety date and I gave you mine. We go to a lot of meetings and we get a home group and I've told you who, what that is. We get someone that we can talk to and that's a sponsor and I've told you who my sponsor is. We take these steps and we get to develop a relationship with the God of our very own understanding. We try to practice the principles we learn in these steps in all of our affairs. Do you have those traditions? Well, they're not just for the group, but learn how to practice them in your own life. And I know that they weren't designed for personal application necessarily, but they have been the most greatest tools I have ever known on how to get along with you and them out there. I, I, I just, they're masters to me. They tell me that we try to carry this message and to be of service. That is the bar they set that's still simplistic guidelines for me in living this as a sober way of life. And so I was in Minneapolis when I got sober. And my last name there was Fegan, and my home group was the 12 and 12 group, and I was very active. I went to work in meetings. That's all I did. I was so, I felt so full of the sunlight of the Spirit, and I was active with sponsorship. My sponsor there sponsored a couple of people, began really to study the book. Um, I don't know about you, but I used to read it, and it just, I just couldn't make the connection. I felt like I had gotten illiterate from drinking, but that wasn't the case. It just took a while for me to begin to study it in a different way, and that began to help. I was shy on my fourth birthday when I moved to Atlanta, and I uh, got that home group locked in, got that sponsor locked in, uh, took a four-year cake, and my mind clicked, and it said, you know what, you're four years sober, and you know something now. That's a real dangerous thought. Um, I don't care how long I'm sober. This is a dangerous thought for this alcoholic. And I didn't check that out with my very experienced sponsor. I listened to that thought because I'm four years sober now. And so I decided that I uh seven meetings a week is an awful lot of meetings to go to, so I think I'm going to trim that down, get a little balance in my life. 
And I about balanced myself out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know about balance. I I quit trying to have balance in my life a long time ago. I just find it easier if I just go on about the day of business. And that seems to work really well for me. But I balanced it down to two or three meetings a week, which became two. And not that I had anything useful for the other five nights of the week, like education or service in other places. No, no, it was self. All more self. And so after two years, and I at this time had legally changed my name um, due to a profession I was interested in, and uh, my home group there was a Skyland group, and my last name at that time was Richards. Um, at six years of sobriety, I am so restless, irritable, and discontent, I am just, just scrunched up inside. Now, I couldn't see the reason why and very simply because I have just shrunk AA down to a compartmentalized show up a couple times a week, got that done for the week kind of activity in my life. It is not anything I'm participating in. I am show up, put a buck in the basket, and go. Take, 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 take. And you, I cannot stay sober by just taking. I was barely hanging on at that point. But that was not going to be a, an awareness for another little while. What became my new awareness is that people, places, and things are going to make me happy. Now, we make the real words are called men, money, and mansions are going to make me happy, okay? And so I sought out to find these important three things. And I, three weeks later, I met a little fella. Well, Hey, you know, he had many of these qualifications. He'd even been sober 13 years, had been to a meeting in three, but no problem. I'm going to help him. And so uh, I set out to help this little feller, and he, you know, he didn't want any of my help because uh, he wasn't interested as I would learn to be sober. And after three months of this insane with insanity within me, this whirlwind romance of which I was the only one involved in, um... This little guy, he got married to somebody else. And uh, so I let him go. And uh, I, uh, I'm i a good sport by now, you know. And um, so I, a few weeks later, gee, here pops up another little fella. He had the same qualifications uh, I was looking for. Did this dance of delusion for three months. And off he went down the aisle with somebody else. And at 6.9 years of sobriety, I came crashing down one more time and had that internal, spiritual, emotional, and mental flatline. But there's a lot more at stake now. And I know that I am an alcoholic and that there is only one avenue of relief. Drinking isn't an avenue anymore. But to recommit myself to Alcoholics Anonymous 110%. Now, I I know there isn't like this 110%, but what that means to me, metaphorically, is that I know everything I know to do. The 10% is a little bit more. That's the cushion more to save me from getting down to 100 and then taking that nail file and just taking it down to 99.99. One day at a time. And that's what I did from four to six years sober. I took that wooden block down to a small one. And so I recommitted myself to Alcoholics Anonymous and I began to look at these steps as if I had never seen them before and I took them again and revitalized and reinvigorated my life and my sobriety. And I've been on that launch ever since. I would uh, get married a few years later and move to Southern California. My name there became Harris, and I was living in Long Beach. Remember the Bellflower Big Book Group for many years? And I would be married, and after five and a half to five years and nine months, we that marriage would come to an end. And, of course, you know, I'm embarrassed and... You know, my ego's involved, and I feel like a chump and a goof and, you know, what an idiot. And, you know, it's not so much what the circumstances were of this this particular emotional time in my life, but what I want to share with you is how you taught me to walk through it, whether it could have been a death in my family or someone important. But it was a, a painful thing to go through, and how I did that was I've seen too many people when they... When they need to, when they're hurting badly, they kick away meetings, they kick away sponsees, they kick away service commitments so that they can focus on resolving this themselves. And they're going to get through it and they just need to do what they need to do. That is fine for them. 
I knew that wasn't going to work in recovery for me. I, I added things to my life. I added meetings. I added commitments. And I kept everybody I sponsored very close to me and to my sponsor. Because these were the things that were going to be my, my arches to help me stay up and going a day at a time how to walk through something. And I've seen so many people walk through things I will never in my life know the difficulty of. And they walked through it with some dignity and grace and they gave me the courage to do the same thing. And so if you, I, after that marriage is over, I got to take a look at me. You know, it's so easy pointing that finger and yet I really do have three looking back at me and I had to realize in my own inventory, I don't know how to be a partner. Selfish, self-centered, and self-serving are really not key qualities to take into a marriage, you know. <clears throat> and that was all I was bringing to the table. And I thought, I have a, I've got a, if, if, if God does have someone in store for me, and I don't even know if he does, I need to make some changes here in my life and how to be someone who can be a partner. And so, I would, I would begin to do things differently and to grow up in this area of my life. It was time now. And at, um, eight years later, I would meet Kent, who is my husband. Um, we met in April of 2000. We got married in April of 2001. That's why I moved to Northern California, changed my name and my home group to the current, that, what current ones that they are. And then I, uh, in 2002, April of 2002, we were back in Atlanta for my um, last of the people, places, and things that were important to me that I wanted Kent to see. And we were there for um, my, the Friday night meeting that I had been an active member in. And, God, that was just great seeing all those folks. And Saturday morning I got up, I said my prayers, and don't ever doubt the power of prayer. Because I'm 20 plus, 26 plus years sober, I say that prayer that morning, please help me stay sober today, relieve me of any obsessions, and show me how I'm be useful. Later on that day, we were at a luncheon, and uh, we sat down, and there were was pre-poured goblets of wine. Now, I've been around alcohol. I mean, I don't try to be around it. I don't search it out, but I've certainly been offered it numerous times, been around people who can drink, and it's just never bothered me. For some reason... I, I confirmed what the beverage was, and I pushed it aside from me, out of my way. And for some reason, I'm not here to psychoanalyze it, but what happened seemed to be a trigger for me that this kicked off a six months physical craving for alcohol. Not the mental obsession. If there was a mental obsession, I would have to say that it was something that protected me from me, from taking the drink, from, from putting myself in situations. I wasn't trying to sneak anything, but I literally felt the craving to be drunk. Not social drink, not have a little sippy poo over here, but for physical intoxication. I haven't had that since I've been sober, and I know and have always known that everything I do is important for moments just like that. But what happened is I thought, what am I doing wrong that it's lingering? I must be doing something wrong. And I would microanalyze myself and, and talk with my sponsor. I didn't even know how to even talk about it, to tell you the truth, because I didn't understand what was happening. And after, I know it's just fast-forwarding here, and, and I, I'm six months into this circle of light and heavy craving and so forth, and I'm at a meeting that morning, it's over, I'm on my way home, and I am gripped with a tear that I would drink against my will. And I am so sick of this, it's scaring me, I don't know what more to do, my physical uh, sobriety is intact, my spiritual connection is as strong as ever, I'm active, I don't know what more to add to my life, to do, to change it, I beg, plead, ask God, I've got a strong connection there. If I had not, I would not have stayed sober, and I know that. And I called my sponsor, and she happened to answer the phone at that time. She'd been having her own things going on and hadn't always been easily available, but God knew I needed her more than anybody else on the planet. And I told her what was happening, and she said, simply words I've heard before, she says, Honey, what we have is the disease of alcoholism, not alcoholism. 
And I know those words, and I know that what that means. But I also knew that for the first time in six months, I could breathe that sigh of relief that I'm not defective. I'm not doing anything wrong. And in looking at all those things that I've been doing, it suddenly, instead of what am I doing is wrong, it became, thank God I was doing everything I was doing. I want you to know that you can have the physical obsession and you can, or, and or you can have the mental obsession. But you don't have to take that drink one day, one hour, one minute at a time. That my sobriety is a daily reprieve, but it's not because we're cute or we live certain places or we do certain things. It is very specific to me, the specific group, that it is contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. This is why I ask God every morning to please help me stay sober today. And I want to thank you for sharing this day of sobriety with me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.